Hey guys, Pastor Jim here for another week uh, with you. Welcome, glad you could join us. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter four. Uh, we'll be in verses 14 through uh, 30. If you're new, welcome. Uh, this is what we typically do is just grab a book of the Bible and walk through it uh, line by line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Uh, and so we, uh, we've we been in Luke for uh, a couple months and we'll be in it for almost a couple of years. Uh, and so we're, we're gonna jump right in, right, right off the bat. Uh, this is going to be a very uncomfortable sermon. Uh, I, I actually don't even really know how to do it uh, on a live stream. Uh, I, I, I can't see you. I can't feel the room. I, I don't know what tone to use. Um, and, and, and really even what exactly uh, to say. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit to bind our hearts together, to do that thing that happens when uh, uh, between a preacher and a congregation, even though I can't see you. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're just not, we're not in the same spot. We're not in the same place. Uh, and we'll just trust that the Spirit will make this work. Uh, but it, it's going to be uncomfortable, uh, uh, mainly for you, but but probably for me a little bit too. I mean, this story ends uh, in Luke here with the congregation trying to kill the preacher, <laughs> uh, and the preacher's Jesus. And so I don't think that uh, uh, I have much of a chance here as well. But we're going to try to make it happen, okay? So our, our author Luke, he does something interesting here that the other gospel writers don't do in their gospel accounts: Matthew, Mark, and John. Uh, Luke, he skips the details of a bunch of Jesus's early ministry, uh, and he spends a lot of time on this one particular story that we're in today, uh, where Jesus heads to his hometown in Nazareth. And, and I think what he wants to do is he wants to highlight really early in his account, his gospel account, uh, what exactly the gospel is and why certain people reject it. Why do certain people not like what Jesus has come to proclaim and to do. Uh, why don't they like it? And, and, and I think it's because if the gospel is just God loves you and he, he loves you and he wants to make your life better, well, nobody would reject it. But if the gospel is more than that, if the gospel says, actually, you are poor, pitiable, wretched, blind, you're a sinner that's far from God, um, but in God's love, he draws near to you and gives you grace, well, then who might reject that? Well, those that don't think that they're poor or pitiable or wretched or blind. They will reject that message, that gospel, that truth. And so, yeah, this is going to be an uncomfortable sermon because to really get it, you have to get that you are wretched and blind and nothing and you need Jesus, okay? So that's, that's what we're going to try to do here. What is the gospel? Why do some people reject it? Um, and, and, and it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for both of us, okay? So let's get started. Verse 14. Luke says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he grew, where he grew up, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the uh, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And so uh, here, here's what's happening. Last week, if you remember, if you were here, if you watched, uh, Jesus was being prepared for ministry. He hadn't started his ministry yet. He was being prepared and it was a preparation by trial and temptation. Uh, where Jesus was tempted uh, and he succeeded, we are tempted and we typically fail. Jesus was uh, obedient to God and trusted God where very often we are not obedient to God and we do not trust God. And it was his preparation for ministry. And after that, verse 14 says, he comes back in the power of the spirit and he begins to do his ministry. Remember, this is gonna be three years of ministry, straight to the cross, and, and to his resurrection. And so he's starting to get famous. People are talking about him. He's doing miracles. He's teaching at the synagogues. He's doing work. Jesus gets to work and he's being glorified by all, meaning that they like him. They like what he's doing. They believe him. They're beginning to talk about him. And so then he comes to his hometown. He's on this teaching to, tour. And so then he does a home show and, and he goes to church uh, and he's going to teach. And typically what would happen in the synagogue, kind of their liturgy, their order of service, is they would sing a few psalms. Uh, they would recite the Shema, 
Uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They would recite that. Uh, then they would recite some benedictions. Then they would read scripture. And so a, a, an attendant, a, a servant in the synagogue would go and grab the, the scrolls. And the first scroll he would grab would be from the Torah, uh, from the, the book of the law. And there'd be a scripture reading. Then he would go back and he would grab one of the prophets. He would grab a scroll of the prophets and somebody would read that and then there would be a sermon. And so probably what happened was that Jesus was asked to be the one to give the sermon. He's the hometown boy. He's the visiting preacher. And so they ask him to read and to preach. And anticipation is high. They had heard about him. And so he stands up and he reads from the book of Isaiah. And it says in verse 18, he unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, and he said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, here's his sermon intro, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus, he reads the text, it's, it's from Isaiah chapter 58 and Isaiah chapter 61, uh, and he sits down, because the teacher in that day would sit down and the people would stand up, I kind of like that. You're comfortable in your couch and on your, you know, in your PJs, and I'm here standing on a on a stage, right? And it's cold. I would I would rather do that. I'm going to sit and you stand. So he he would he would sit down. He would begin to teach, and everybody's in anticipation, waiting to see what he would say. And he starts off his sermon with a bang. Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, and they all knew what he meant. They all knew what he was saying. Uh, this is a messianic prophecy that he just read. I mean, Isaiah 61 is a huge, huge text. I mean, they would hold big Isaiah 61 signs up at their football games. I mean, this is John 3.16 for them. And Jesus says, all that stuff in Isaiah 61, all that stuff, that starts now. I'm him. I'm the Messiah. I'm him. Right? This is a big deal. Jesus is saying, I'm the promised anointed king. I'm the rescuer. I've come to be king, okay? And then all these things that Jesus said he's going to do, preach good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, making the blind see, freeing the oppressed, they all have both spiritual and actual realities associated with them. Meaning Jesus came for the outsider, for the lower class, uh, the ones that, that, that realize, or the ones that, 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 that finally realize their neediness. Right? For example, this was a culture with a class system. Jesus is preaching to a culture that has a class system, and it's a class system based on ethnicity and gender and family and wealth. And so the poor then are the lower class, the forgotten, those who have nothing. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to meet in love the needs of those who need God. I'm going to meet and love the needs of those who need God. I'm the Messiah, and this stuff, this great Isaiah 61 stuff, it starts with me, okay? And they love it. They love this sermon. Look at verse 22. And they all spoke well of him and marveled. This is what you guys do with me, right? Uh, they all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, he knows their hearts, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So they love his sermon. I mean, when they say, man, isn't this Joe's kid? They aren't denigrating him. What they're saying is, man, this is great. Like if, if this is really the Messiah, then, then he's one of us. He's one of us. This is amazing. This is, this is great. But Jesus knows that something is missing. He discerns their hearts and, and maybe he heard some of the chatter and he, he, he says to them, I, I bet you're going to want to have me heal here too, to do some miracles here too. Because what I heard you say is, we heard that you did some things in Capernaum. Will you do that here too? Right? They heard that he did, meaning they're not sure yet. They haven't quite believed that he is. They're not quite sure. They want to see a sign. They want him to prove it. 
Okay, so here, here's probably what's happening. And I think this is important for us to understand so that we get what the disconnect is here. What, what, what's about to happen next? Why does it happen? I think we have to kind of understand this interchange right here. They had just heard this amazing thing that the Messiah has come and he's come to the poor and the needy, but it hasn't wrecked them yet. It hasn't wrecked them yet. It hasn't hit them yet. They don't quite see that it's them that the Messiah has to come to, right? Not in that kind of way. There's not a humility in them. They aren't rejoicing yet. And yeah, they probably thought that they were needy. They thought that they were poor. I mean, they're from Nazareth. This is a town of maybe 500 people. Uh, if you remember, one of the disciples, uh, uh, his, his buddy comes to him and is like, man, Jesus is the disciple, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's Nazareth. It's, it's a podunk town. It's, it's Cleburne. It's Alvarado. It's nothing. It's, it's Nowhereville, right? And, they, and so they probably thought they were a little bit poor and they probably thought that they were oppressed, that they were captives. The, the text in Isaiah was written during a time in which God's people were in exile. They were in captivity. And then these people in Nazareth right now, they're under Roman occupation. They're under Roman oppression. They are slaves and captive and poor to a godless uh, Roman government. But Jesus knows their hearts and he knows that they're still clinging to some things. We're going to find out here in a moment because of how they respond. He knows, though, that they're still clinging to their ethnicity, to their culture, to their morality. They aren't needy enough yet. They aren't spiritually poor yet. They're spiritually middle class. They aren't wrecked yet by the message of the gospel. And so he says in verse 24, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. He knows what's going to happen. He knows how they're going to respond. And he tells them these two stories. Verse 25, But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only, circle, highlight only, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So this goes south really quick, right? They went from, man, this is awesome. This is the Messiah. He's one of us to wanting to kill him. Why? Like what's happening here? What did Jesus say to set them off? Well, he tells these two Old Testament stories, famous stories that they would have known about two famous prophets, Elijah and Elisha. The Elijah story, it's in 1 Kings 17, maybe you've read it, uh, where everybody's hungry, there's a famine in the land, but God sends Elijah, his great prophet, only to this one widow. She's a Gentile, right? She's in Sidon, what is modern day Lebanon. She's a Gentile. She's not a Jew. She's not one of God's people. And, and what happened is I, Elijah runs into this gal, this widow. She's only got a little bit of flour and oil left. Uh, Elijah says, what are you doing? She says, I'm going to make my, my last cake for me and my son, and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, make the cake, but give it to me and then go back and make another cake for you and your son. And God told me that you will never run out of flour or oil until he begins to make it rain again. Beautiful story. And then the story of Elisha is in 2 Kings 5, where we have this Syrian general. He's a commander of the whole Syrian army. He's not a good dude at all, but he gets leprosy. And he's got a slave Jewish girl who knows about the prophet Elisha, knows that Elisha could heal him. So she tells him about him. He goes to see him. It doesn't go well at first. He doesn't like at all what Elisha tells him to do, but he eventually humbles himself and he is healed. What's the big deal with these stories? Why does this set off this, this whole town and why do they try to stone Jesus? Well, the key word here is the one word that Jesus uses, the word only. In verse 26, Elijah was sent only to Zarephath. In verse 27 again, Elisha was sent only to Naaman. 
These prophets were sent only to the Gentiles, only to the outsider. Jesus is not coming also to the outsider, but only to the outsider. Jesus is coming not also for the broken and the poor and the messed up. He's coming only for the broken and the poor and the messed up, right? Jesus is coming only to the minority group, only to the lower class, only to the needy. You have to be needy for Jesus to come to you. Jesus doesn't fit our paradigms. Right? Like in our day, man, we want Jesus to vote our way, to champion our cause, to support our mission, to give us a little bump in our already pretty good life. But Jesus doesn't conform to us. He's God. And Jesus isn't a life coach or a cheerleader. He's a redeemer, a rescuer. And so if you don't think you need rescuing, then you won't think you need Jesus. Jesus only comes to those who need him. And listen, they just didn't think that they were all that bad. Maybe you don't think you're all that bad. They just didn't think that they really needed him, not in that kind of way. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark says that they were offended. It was a shorter account, but he he uses this one word, offended. It's the Greek word scandal. This was a scandal to them, right? I mean, think about it. Put yourself in their shoes. They show up every Sabbath, They go to the synagogue. They sing the Psalms. They read the Bible. They stand through the sermon, man. They don't get comfortable chairs. They don't get to sit on their couch. They stand through a sermon. They're good people, religious people, moral people, and they're waiting for the Lord to deliver them from uh, Roman occupation, and the Lord comes, and they want to kill him. That's amazing. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Remember the older brother, the good one, the moral one, the obedient one, the religious one? How does he respond when the father welcomes back the younger brother, the, 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 the crazy brother, the sinful brother? How does he respond when the father welcomes the younger brother back into the home and throws him a party? He's furious. Right? They're furious in the same way. They're responding how most good, moral, Bible Belt, religious folks respond when they really hear the gospel when they really hear that they are sinners in need of a savior and they have nothing, absolutely nothing to offer God. And so they're furious too and they try to kill him. Which by the way, they're not gonna be the only ones. Uh, That's how Jesus actually dies. Religious people who are furious at the scandal of the gospel and they kill him. They kill him. Why? Why did they like Jesus at first and then want to kill him a minute later? Well, it's because they weren't spiritually poor. They were just merely spiritually middle class. They weren't spiritually poor. It's kind of like being at, uh, maybe you've ever, maybe you've been in, in one of these spaces. Uh, have you ever been a, a, at a, a nonprofit fundraiser? Right? You're at a nonprofit fundraiser and you've got all these people like just clapping, man, clapping at these stories, right? These stories of like the, 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 the poor gal who got out of a bad life or some bad habits or the, the, the guy who reformed his life out of homelessness or, or prison or whatever it is, right? And you just got these rich, put together folk clapping all the while these wonderful stories of mercy and grace and not realizing that they're poor too, that they are captives. Two, right? That they are needy too. They're, they're like the church in Laodicea that Jesus speaks to in Revelation 3, where he says, For you say to me, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They just don't know. They don't know. The arrogant, self satisfied, self sufficient, wealthy American is utterly poverty-stricken and miserable to God, but they don't realize it. They don't know. The spiritually middle class, they don't know. They don't know how needy they actually are. The spiritually middle class, that's where your life is pretty good. You don't really need a savior, you need a life coach. You need a cheerleader. You need a little bit of help to get a little bit more ahead. And like most middle class folk, you want things safe. Right? You want a safe church with a good, cheery, uplifting message uh, of a God who, of course, would love you and is going to help you along in your already pretty good life. 
and you like your neighborhood safe too. Just like middle class people want their neighborhood safe, spiritually middle class people want their neighborhood safe. And so we don't want to let those sinners in the doors, not the real ones. And, and we, we don't want the ones that dress that particular way or barely know the Bible at all and don't know all the jargon and they're still sleeping with the girlfriend or their boyfriend or they, maybe they've had an abortish, abortion or they're gay or whatever it is. We don't want the real sinners in our safe neighborhood. We don't want their kids with our kids in Kid City, not in our safe neighborhood of a church. No way because that's how middle-class people think. They, they can afford to worry about things that poor people don't typically worry about. Have you ever noticed that poor people don't care about the things that we care about? Uh, and I know some of you are legitimately, like actually poor, but the majority of us aren't. And, and we get anxious about things that poor people don't get anxious about. We worry about things that, uh, you know, the kids in the favelas in Brazil don't even ever think about. Like whenever, whenever I want to guilt my kids, uh, whenever I want to, um, you know, uh, make them feel bad about their, their spoiledness, I'll show them pictures uh, from my trips to Brazil, okay? And it's wonderfully effective. It's terrible parenting, but wonderfully effective. But it's the same way for the spiritually middle class. We care about church and we care about life and we care about stuff in ways that the spiritually poor never think about. They never think about. Like we get so frustrated about how our leaders might respond to a current event or by the style of music or the inconvenience of something or the way in which the church is doing this or the way in which my life is going in this way. We get worried about things, concerned about things that the spiritually poor never think about at all. I literally was at a church years ago before we planted this one where a family left because they didn't want their kids in the kids' ministry where there were some kids who didn't properly behave. And what they meant was they were talking about the poor brown kids who only had a single mom and weren't as behaved and well-mannered as theirs. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The spiritually poor don't think about those things. They're just looking for food. They're just thirsty. They just want grace. All they care about is, is there good news? Is there hope? Does somebody have food and water for me? Can somebody help me? Right? They don't think about comfort or music style or politics or anti-vaxxer movements. They can't afford to. They just want food. Man, give me grace. Give me mercy. Give me hope. I need it. I'm needy. That's all that they can think about. That's all they can afford to think about. And listen, there are many lepers in the church in America today. And there are many widows in the church in America today, but they just don't know it. They don't know it. They don't know that they are poor. They don't know that they are blind. They don't know that they are captives, that they have been held captive by their things and their stuff and their self-sufficiency. And just like Jesus' hometown, the American church in large part, has basically cast him out, which is why you have what you have. It's why you have Christian nationalism. It's why you have an impotent evangelicalism. It's why you have a, a sometimes a, a social justice movement absent of any sort of gospel. It is a Christless Christianity that you have when you have religious people in churches who don't realize they need Jesus too. Those most in need of grace and mercy are most often those who don't even realize it. Uh, I guarantee that there's some guy or gal watching right now uh, that has absolutely shipwrecked their life and they are just hoping and begging that this is true, that Jesus is a rescuer, that Jesus is a redeemer, that he does come to the spiritually poor, that he does come to the needy, that he does come to the minority, to the outcast. They're begging that this would be true because they know they're needy because they've hit rock bottom. If that's you, be encouraged. This is true, right? And this is really easy for Jesus. That's who he came to, people like you. This is easy for him. But it's the rest of us that are watching, the spiritually middle class that need a greater miracle. You need a greater miracle than the person that has hit rock bottom. One of the commentators that I, I read uh, in Luke uh, over the course of this series, he tells a story uh, about a church in England uh, back you know, in, in the 20th century. 
And, and it reminds me of a little bit of our church here as well. It was a bigger church and a, a good part of town. It was faithful. It had planted three church plants uh, around the city. And what, what they would do is once a year, they would, they would have all the churches uh, come back to their church, the main church, the headquartered church. And, and, and once a year, they would do communion together. Right? They, would, they would take the Lord's Supper together. And the other churches were primarily planted in, in like poorer parts of the city. And so it was just this beautiful thing where you would have uh, former drug addicts and thieves and prostitutes taking the Lord's Supper with these politicians and these businessmen. And this one particular Sunday, the pastor saw that there was a former convict kneeling next to the judge that had convicted him, next to the very judge that had put him away years before And after the service, that very judge came up to the pastor and said, did you see who was kneeling down next to me? And the pastor said, yeah, I, I saw. And the, the judge said, um, he, he says, what a miracle of grace. And the pastor said, absolutely, a, a miracle of grace indeed. And, and then the judge looked at him and said, wait, who, who are you talking about? And the pastor said, well, what do you mean? And the judge said, well, I'm talking about me not the convict. And the pastor said, really? What are you talking about? And the pastor said this, or the judge said this, it is not surprising that this thief received God's grace during his time in prison. He had nothing but a terrible upbringing, a life of crime. He had nothing. And when he understood Jesus as his savior, he knew that there was hope for him. He knew how much he needed God. But, he says to the pastor, look at me. From my childhood, I was taught to live as a gentleman. I went to church, I said my prayers, I went to Oxford, I got my degree, I passed the bar, I became a judge. I was sure I was all I needed to be, though I too was a sinner. Pastor, it was God's grace that drew me in. It was God's grace that opened my heart. I'm the greater miracle. Some of you, some of you need the greater miracle. Listen, um, I have sinned sexually in ways that are too shameful to mention. Uh, at 18, I was silent while somebody aborted my baby. I did the party scene like I was trying to win an award. I tried every drug at least once, and I can be absolutely sickened by my pride, my vanity, my sin. I know I need a savior, and I know I'm nothing without him, and I don't deserve anything at all, and it's all by grace. And some of you, man, that, like, that's your story too. In our church, praise be to God, we, are, we have people who are homeless, are homeless, who are prostitutes, are prostitutes, who are drug addicts, are drug addicts, who are in prison, who are atheists, who are godless, who are broken beyond their comprehension. But it takes a greater miracle for some of you. For some of you, so it seems, who don't think you need much of Jesus. I mean, not really a lot of them. Or you give lip service to him because you're in the South, because you're a Christian, because you come to church or watch a live stream every once in a while. But you're only a Christian because you're not something else. Or you're not a Muslim, you're not a Mormon, so you're a Christian. You don't really need him. Right? You only have a little bit of sin, and so you only need a little bit of Jesus. You're not poor, you're not oppressed, you're not in bondage. You're actually pretty good. Your life's pretty good. But woe is you who saunters onto a live stream when it's convenient for you and all, you know, by and large, is kind of boring to you and it's not stirred in your heart at all and you're not aware at all of your misery without him and you don't really need him, you need the greater miracle. I came to Texas a decade ago from a place where people weren't Christians and it was weird to go to church. And I came to this very strange place, this buckle of the Bible belt, where everyone is a Christian, but nobody actually really fears God. Nobody actually really worships God or obeys God, right? Jesus isn't central to their life. He isn't everything to them. What kind of Christianity is that? That's not real. That's not Christianity. And so wake up if you are the religious, Wake up if you're bored with Jesus. This is the God of the universe that we're talking about. Aren't you a little bit scared of him? You've gotten maybe way too comfortable. You need even more grace. You need a greater miracle. You need to die before he can make you alive. 
right? Some of you are in a fantasy world. You're on life support, kept alive by money and comfort and nice clothes and safe lives, but it's not real life. You have to die to all of that that you might live in him. You need a greater miracle. The bread and the wine, the bread and the wine are for those who are hungry and thirsty, not for those who think that they are filled up, not for those who think that they are full. Right? I know it's weird, man. We, we ask you to take the Lord's Supper even on a live stream uh, as you're at home. You need that with your community, with your, your small group, your family, whoever you're worshiping with. You, you need to do that, but don't do that today unless you're actually hungry unless you're actually thirsty, right? Until you realize that you will die if you don't eat of grace. You will die if you don't drink of his mercy. You will die. You are poor. You are needy. You are starving without the grace and mercy of Jesus. Unless you have the truth of the gospel, unless you have more of him, don't eat. Don't drink. That's not Christianity. That's not the Lord's Supper. It doesn't matter if you're the judge or you're the wicked sinner. You need grace too. You need grace too. Jesus will meet in love only the needs of those who need God. Let's pray. Father, I pray for my friends at home. I pray that they would receive this message. I pray that they would hear this truth. I pray that they would see their need, that they are poor, that blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be satisfied. Only you can satisfy. God, would you make them see? Would you make blind eyes see their need for you? God, I need to see you clearly. I need to see my great need for you. I need more of you. Would you give us eyes to see In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to give you a few moments to respond. I do want you to take of the Lord's Supper, but only when you're ready. Take it when you're hungry. Spend a few moments and see how thirsty you really are. Go ahead and take a few moments to do that. And then Maya and Joel, they'll be back to send you off. I love you.